What is leaky gut? Leaky gut's a great term, actually. Uh, you know, right now, you know, 20 years ago when I, when I finished my fellowship, leaky gut was a term that was, that was used, and it was almost, uh, people said it didn't exist. And now there's conferences, you know, in GI medicine with the term leaky gut, because it's an easy term for the patient to understand. So when we look at the microbiome and we look at the cellular function of your GI tract, okay, there's these little, what they call tiny villi. So if we did an endoscopy or a colonoscopy and you look at a picture of someone's GI tract, it just looks like this pink tube. You know, most people get their report from the colonoscopy, the doctor and be like, here's a pink tube. And what we're looking for is usually like a polyp or a tumor or a bleed or outpouching or something that you can physically see. That's the gross pathology that we're looking at. But when we're saying leaky gut, we're, look, we're looking at the cellular function. When food and all the nutrients are there, like the carbohydrates, the fats, the protein, vitamins and minerals, how is that being absorbed in this tube? We can't see that from a gross picture with a, with a scope. But when we look at a microscope into those little cells, there's these what we call tiny little villi. It's almost like velvet, okay? And this is what the, the, the surface area of the GI tract is. In fact, your GI tract is about 30, 35 feet long, and that surface area is about two tennis courts worth of surface area, okay? So how does all this stuff get absorbed? That's what we're looking at with leaky gut. Because when we take antibiotics, when we take chemotherapy, we get a foodborne illness, or we get other type of thing like a gastroenteritis from a virus, for example, that destroys and just creates dysfunction. I'll give you an example. One pill of an antibiotic can cause GI dysfunction up to 18 months later. Right? Now, we do need antibiotics. We're not against you know, antibiotics, but a lot of times they're dispensed too quickly for a viral infection, for example. Or a simple urinary tract where we can get rid of it with other things. It's like, oh, here's a Z-Pack, or here's a Cipro, or something. And people come to my office, and they're like, on the sixth time in the last few months. So this develops resistance, but it keeps knocking out their microbiome, which then lowers their immune system function, so they're more prone to get sick again, and the cycle goes on and on. Okay? So we have to look at restoring that, and then when we look at giving something very specific, we have to be targeted. How do you know that a patient might be deficient in a vitamin or a mineral? So that's a great question, because when we look at patients in terms of deficiencies, we actually test for that. You know, a, a lot of the doctors here were saying, you know, eat more of these foods you know, to get these nutrients, and that's what we should be doing for everybody. Eat more vegetables and fruits and beans and greens and you know, onions and mushrooms and seeds and berries, all those plant-based foods organically as much as possible. But we have to look at each person as an individual. That's, again, we're individualizing medicine because it's not just putting it in a computer program saying eat more or I think you're getting this. It's like what is your body absorbing? What is the levels? So just like when people check their blood pressure, that's your blood pressure. When they check your cholesterol, your blood sugar, that's your blood pressure or cholesterol or your blood pressure or blood sugar number. So we actually test the nutrients, and we're able to test all the antioxidants, A, C, E, CoQ10, you know, glutathione, all the B vitamins, not just B12 that most people in folate just check, and we look at all the minerals like you know, zinc and mobidium and magnesium. These are all important factors in health. We look at the omega 3s, 6, and 9s. We look at you know, heavy metals. We look at detoxification pathways. Even how you convert these things metabolically is what we look at because it's not just giving something. It's like, do we need to give it for a reason? So for example, supplements, supplement the diet, and they never replace the diet. So a lot of people are redundant. They're like, I eat a bunch of this stuff, and then I take this supplement, which is basically the same thing. What we want to look at, if there's a deficiency, that's when supplementation can be very helpful, because that's raising those levels up to normal, and then they can maintain by the diet. Right? But until then, a lot of people are just, you know, they're missing something. So if you miss something, there's pathways in the body where each nutrient, for example, each vitamin and mineral, they, they control thousands of reactions. You know, they sell something in the store, vitamin A's for this, vitamin E's for that, but actually it can be in every single section of the store because, you know, when you eat kale or you eat a blueberry, there's thousands of compounds in there that do all these things. We only put one kind of action on each bottle because we can only remember one thing sometimes at a time, right? So we have to, be, uh, we have to understand that, that when we look at nutrient testing, it's key because a lot of people just say, well, I think you have a deficiency or I think you need this. If your levels of CoQ10 is, is normal, why should you take CoQ10? Well, unless you're an athlete or you have some kind of, you know, I'm going to do a challenge or I need to get a little bit more energy if I'm going to deplete it. But if, you know, that's also an expense and out of pocket cost for the patient. So we look at if you're deficient, that's where your money, you get your biggest bang for your buck, and then we can actually target those therapies so that when people take supplements, they can actually say, I do feel better. I take this herb, I do feel better. I took this product, I do feel better. Without that, most people are like, here's my bag of this and here's my bag of that. How do you feel? I feel terrible on all these levels, right? And so we want to make sure that we can kind of pare that down and the things that are redundant or things that we don't need, that should be put into eating healthier diet. 
If someone eats a whole food plant-based diet, can they still have nutritional deficiencies? Yes, and that's why we test. So looking at the microbiome, looking at you know, food sensitivities, looking at things that trigger inflammation, and actually looking at the nutrient levels. So for example, if you or your partner were eating the same foods and eating the same supplements and doing the same juicing and all these other things, your tests are gonna be completely different. Because we're not robots, not 100% out, not 100% out. Someone might have a little bit more loose bowel movements, someone might have a little bit more constipation, some people might have other health is issues that uh, have malabsorption problems, or you know, some levels might be too high. So we have to be very targeted now, the best part of testing is then we know how much to give. So it'll be specific. It's not just like you're low. It's going to tell you how much to take. But even better, what we like to do is that our tests will then show what foods you should be eating more of. So it's not just, oh, here's another pill. Here's another vitamin or mineral. I'm going to say, here are the foods that you should be eating. Eat that three times more a week to get, because when you take it from the food, you're also getting all the other aspects, like the protein and the phytonutrients and the fiber, not just, say, for example, the antioxidants. Unless it's super deficient, then that's when targeted therapies can have wonderful benefits. In chapter five of Inflammation Nation, what did you mean by step three, detoxification, clearing the toxins? So all of us have some kind of toxin overload, right? But that word is totally misused in the Western culture. Uh, in my book, I, I kind of go into the real detail of what true detoxification means. Detoxification actually comes out of India, Ayurvedic medicine, where they have a program called Panchakarma. And that's going to be detailed in the book, so those people who want to know a little bit more about Panchakarma, that's a specialty that we do in our clinic in Sanjevani in Albuquerque. And that's something that is in Ayurvedic medicine. It's how do we detoxify the body, but it's not what considers here in the United States, people do a seven-day colon cleanse, or I'm going to drink wheatgrass or green juicing. You know, that's kind of a, a, a bowel cleanse in terms of like you're just having a lot more fiber and, and greens. But we're talking about true detoxification. How do you actually move the toxins from the mind, the body, the, all the tissues? And so in Ayurvedic medicine, it's a series of treatments. It's not just a simple kind of cleanse. And so when we look at detoxification, we have a specialty to do that. Now, for the just general term of detoxification, if people move to a whole food plant-based diet, and if they're eating an anti-inflammatory diet, and when they get to the 40 grams of fiber that they need a day, that's normal detoxification. Having one to three normal, well-formed bowel movements is just regular physiological detoxification. Everybody wants to sell a detox smoothie and a detox program. And this is the hot word in the, in the last five years, particularly on social media. But that's, that's a little bit of a false narrative. And that's usually sold by people who are just selling products. They're looking at how do we actually eliminate these things? Is it actually a science and an art? But it's not just like I take this and opens channels and I get rid of it. That's really, that's really minimalistic understanding of physiology, anatomy, and immune system. So once people understand true detoxification, that's when there's an actual ability to not only eliminate, but also strengthen the system as well. Do you recommend colonics or coffee enemas? No. I don't recommend coffee enemas or colonics. And the reason being is because it disrupts the microbiome. You know, some of these, these alternative pra uh, practices are, con are really new. You know, when we look at Ayurvedic medicine for 4,000 years and Chinese medicine, and we go to African cultures and we go to Asian cultures and, you know, uh, South American cultures, we don't see this kind of therapy ever given, right? Water is a drying agent. So actually water actually dries the internal side of the, the, the colon and actually causes more of a drying effect. So even in Ayurvedic medicine, when we do something called a basti, which is like an enema, it's, it's, it's used in oil because we never use water. Right? But we were never intended to be like jiffy lubed. We were never just supposed to go and like, let me flush. Now, most people will feel better because most people are constipated. You know, the average person we see is having a, if they're constipated, they're having a bowel movement every other day, every three days, every five days. In fact, the other day I had a patient that came in every six to eight days of bowel movement. Right? So this is normal. Right? So, but that's abnormal just to say, well, let me just hook you up and flush you. Now, coffee enema, same thing because, you know, it's best to drink the coffee from above. <laughs> you can get all the polyphenols and antioxidants, again, organic, you know, not more than two cups a day. But the idea of like stimulating something via the rectum to get that benefit is a little bit of a, trying to bypass the story of like understanding physiology, right? And the worst thing is that it does disrupt the microbiome. So we now, since we do microbiome testing and we have patients who go get colonics or they go to, you know, some kind of can alternative cancer facility and they do these coffee enemas, we can actually show the disruption. Because once you flush out those probiotics in the gut, you cannot replenish them. So that's the key thing that people need to understand is that when the microbiome is dysfunctional, you just can't say, I do a colonic and then just take a little probiotic. Remember, there's a thousand species. We usually give 12 to 15 in a pill. And you know, we give maybe 1 billion, 10 billion. We give 100 billion, 
right? But there's 100 trillion in your gut of over 1,000 species. So you can never make that up. If someone takes all the supplements in the marketplace, there's about 50 to 60 species of probiotics that are available. Again, you have over 1,000. So it actually causes more dysfunction because you cannot replace that very easily. So we, I'm, I'm, I'm very cautious, and I recommend people not to do colonics and not to do uh, coffee enemas. If they were eating the proper diet, you wouldn't need to have that. The problem is most people don't eat the proper diet. So it's, again, it's the quick fix. I'm const you know, it's just another pill in a therapy form of treating a symptom and not going to the underlying cause. What about green smoothies and juices for detoxification? Do you recommend green juices made of organic green vegetables and sprouts? So, again, the word detoxification is misunderstood. So people say, and I see it all the time, and I get all my patients come in, they're like, oh, I'm doing this green smoothie program, and you know, it's detoxifying me. It's like, no, you're, you're eating some healthy food. But the problem is some of those programs, and almost most of them that I've seen, is that they're not nutritionally sound. So is drinking a green juice healthy? Yeah, it's better than drinking a soda. It's like the more that you can cram in more greens and vegetables and fruits in your diet, please do. But to say that you know, this is gonna magically do that, what most of the people who have created those diets have not understood nutrition. So they're actually lacking. If I, if I just eat two greens and put you know, a few vegetables or fruit, it's healthy, but then they're still missing most of the carbohydrates, the proteins, the fats, all the 33 essential nutrient vitamins and minerals because they don't understand nutritional foods. So there's a little bit of a limitation. Is it healthy? Sure. Is it truly doing what they're saying? Not necessarily, right? And so we actually have protocols that we look at that if someone wants to do a juice protocol, here's all the things that you need to put in if it's going to be a true meal replacement. Otherwise, a lot of people will go through the detox. They're getting actually lack of their full nutrient-dense foods that they need. And they say, oh, I'm feeling tired. I'm feeling exhausted. But that's the detox reaction that they told me I'm supposed to have. I'm like, no, you're not getting fully nutritious food. And there's a difference of that. So that's why we have to look at moving. You know, right now, the word even nutritionist on the internet and, you know, means nothing. You know, any, everybody's now a health expert that you know, has millions of followers and sell programs. We have to look at, is there a science to back their claims? And if they are providing a product, then you know, does it have the best ingredients? And is it, you know, even if it's a recipe, is that recipe giving them exactly what they need? And what we find is that most of them fall short.